Hey everyone, welcome back to the Film Fund Podcast. I'm your host, founder, and executive producer at the Film Fund, Thomas Verity. I'm also an award-winning filmmaker, producer, and film festival judge. I started the Film Fund to give filmmakers an easier, alternative way to get their film funded. Instead of working on a screenplay, crowdfunding campaign, or grant application, you write one sentence pitching your film for a chance to receive up to $10,000 and other prizes to make it. There are only a few weeks left in our winter 2021 narrative and documentary contest, so don't forget to submit your pitch. Check us out at thefilmfund.co to enter your one-sentence pitch for a chance to win up to $10,000 to make your film. And I want to remind listeners that contests do happen regularly, so if you are listening at a later date, check the website at thefilmfund.co for the most up-to-date information. Today, we have Tommy Garcia on the show, winner of the Film Fund's Narrative Short Film Contest. Tommy is an award-winning director and filmmaker. His funded short film project, Life Tune, is being released soon. I believe it's currently in post-production. Tommy, thank you so much for coming. Could you give us a brief background yourself? Uh, thank you for having me. Um, yes, I am a writer at heart. I kind of uh, fell into directing, or directing fell into me, I don't know. Um, from Orange County, California. Um, it was once known as the place where good Republicans go to die, and now it's just kind of a purpley extension of LA. Uh, <laughs> grew up around here. Um, yeah, just suburban childhood, making movies with my dad's handy cam and some uh, neighborhood and schoolyard friends. Um, you know, they would always say, oh, this is so much fun, we're making movies. And I'd be like, no, this is serious. And then they'd be like, we don't, we don't want to play anymore. Um, so, yeah, I guess I was, back then I was directing, but um, I didn't think of it as directing. I was just playing with a camera. I thought I wanted to be an actor. Um, and then I discovered myself as a writer. Um, I wrote my first screenplay when I was like 12. It was 70 pages called House of Spirits. Um, yeah. I, I That's think pretty I, good for a 12-year-old, 70 pages. Good for you. Yes, I think I had my mom write like the big monologue in the... <laughs> okay. <laughs> I write my own monologues now. Um, mm. But um, that actually evolved into one of my... Uh, feature scripts that I wrote recently. We can get into that more later. Um, so yeah, I'm a writer at heart and then um, kind of got distracted in my teenage years. Um, thought I wanted to, uh, well, I became a business major at a Cal State Long Beach. Um, trivia, that's where Steven Spielberg went. Um, oh, no way. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I was a meddling business student and then on a whim I was like oh wait I should do film as a minor um you know that might be fun I like movies and then immediately all my all those childhood memories came flooding back to me <laughs> of the handy cam and you know bossing around my friends and uh yeah so I just kind of continued as a writer was honing that craft and it was really hard for me to give up my babies to someone else to direct and so I just kind of wound up directing myself um and well actually because when you're a student making student movies you know you're not paying people so I was kind of doing everything and I right. thought oh I don't I don't want to be a director this is terrible and um then when I did my first uh movie not as a student and, you know, people were actually paid to do their jobs and I actually got to direct. I was like, oh, oh, <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I, I get it. And this is just what I'm meant to do. So now that's what I'm doing. So I don't tell us about I, your uh, tell us about ahead. your winning pit. Tell, yeah, sorry. This remote podcasting is always interesting. Always try not to interrupt people. But um, <laughs> Tell us about your winning pitch a little bit. Uh, well, Life Tune, it is the third of my, um, I guess of this phase of my career, my shorts. This is the third in my, I guess, the Tommy trilogy, I would call it. Uh, it's a tragicomedy, 
And um, actually, it was the winning pitch last year, but then uh, coronavirus happened and things were uncertain. Mm -hmm. Luckily, we had already shot and were in post, so uh, no issues there. But, you know, I just kind of wanted to do it right. And I think it may have been... I think in 2020, people may have been too focused on the tragedy and less on the comedy of it. So I think it feels right that uh, it's in VFX right now. So uh, moving on to the soundtrack and then... uh, You think now that things are kind of opening up a little bit and people are maybe being a little more optimistic, that'll influence how they I just think, yeah, I think it would have just been a little dark, but it's it's not bleak. I'll say that. It's dark, but not bleak. Um, and, well, it's about a... I don't know if I can share my sentence or if I should go around Honestly, it. I've our policy is that we don't release the sentences until the films are released, but I do that oh, that's out of okay. respect for the... Well, uh-huh. hang on. I, I do that out of respect for the filmmakers. I kind of leave it up to them just because some filmmakers are very protective of their ideas and they don't want people to steal them. But if you're comfortable sharing the pitch sentence, we can definitely do that. But if not, uh, we can wait. So I'm going to leave that up to you. Well, let's see. I'll, I'll just change a couple words. Okay. A young woman's fantasy collides with reality when her online boyfriend wishes to meet the person she's pretending to be. So, uh, <laughs> that's obviously a conflict. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I think the, f- the funding use was for post-production, right? And the, the actual pitch you submitted. Yes. Um, yeah, there was that Adobe Cloud uh, subscription, which definitely helped with some of the promo materials. And mm-hmm. uh, it's, been, it's just been nice. You've been getting me in touch with... Uh, various post people which is nice because the hiring process is always very exhaustive for me yeah we Um, always try to connect people wherever we can um tommy needed some post-production help and vfx work so i linked him up with maestro filmworks who sometimes sponsors a prize with the film work the the film work (laughs) the film fund so we know them pretty well um happy to connect people there tommy what um what inspired you to make the film well it kind of took me back to being in middle school, which is was kind of the Wild West days of the internet, like a AOL Instant Messenger and chat rooms and Do you remember all that. your AIM screen name? I think it was... <laughs> there were a few. I think it was F.V. Mm. Beach Dude. <laughs> FV for Fountain Valley <laughs> where I grew up um, mm-hmm. and uh, so I guess well being a, a fat gay kid in middle school uh, life isn't so fun so I would kind of create different personas on the internet and okay. just pretend I would be someone else um, mm-hmm. and Later on, you know, I came into myself and, you know, stopped doing that. (laughs) Um, Not only because, you know, morally it's just not uh, something you should do, but also just because I came, you know, to appreciate myself as a person and there was no need to kind of create this uh, facade. But those years always stuck with me and... That was, I think, before the term catfish came into use. I think it was the okay. documentary that uh, mm-hmm. that kind of coined the term. So, yeah, there was a lot of coverage in the media about people who do that. And I was always very interested by those stories because these people do, you know, they're online deceiving people. And you just think, oh, what a terrible person who would do that. But then you kind of delve into these people's stories and realize how terrible often their lives are, you know, so horrible. Mm -hmm. You know, they experience things you wouldn't wish on anybody. And they kind of, as a result, wind up doing something uh, ethically, you know, questionable themselves. So I just kind of, the whole morality, that whole gray area of, you know, just because you've been mistreated doesn't mean you can mistreat others. 
but how do you kind of break this cycle? So, yeah, I was always influenced by that, and uh, that's how the kind of, the main character of Fran kind of came to be. And well, I, I'll keep this part secret because we we can't reveal everything. But the kicker was modern technology. So I was kind of inspired by, uh, you know, the various chat apps and especially with the pandemic, you know, uh, we're always communicating online and some of the modern technology fused with those uh, experiences of middle school and the whole idea of catfishing and it kind of evolved into a uh, life tune. That's awesome. I everyone as a either a writer or a filmmaker or a creative we're always putting part of ourself i think in our characters and it seems like you definitely did this a little bit with life too and used your um your experiences growing up to influence the story so um i just always find it so interesting people's backgrounds where they come from how they dealt with you know maybe trauma in their life and how that influences the stories they tell and it's it's always it's always just so interesting and i i think it's a great film and really sends an interesting message to um, the people watching it. Um, about the, the film fund, what are your favorite things about the film fund? Um, well, oh, the other good thing, uh, you kind of va validated myself because, you know, you're with the project for so long and you're like, is it actually good? Am I, am I just mm -hmm. crazy? So <laughs> it's nice to have that <laughs> validation. <laughs> you seem to like where I'm going with this. Um, well, like, I guess the film fund, I like that it doesn't really beat around the bush, especially as a writer with screenplay competitions. You know, you'll you'll be working on something, even if you consider it kind of like a quiet indie movie, and you'll just be, you know, I'm a struggling perfectionist, so I'll be working on all those little nitty-gritty details where I'm thinking, oh, even if you don't consciously perceive these... Uh, all these little nuances, you know, they're there, but you know, in competitions, they, they don't care. <laughs> like they're just like, right. can, can, what, what's the, what's the log line? What's the gist of it? You know, is the concept interesting? Like who cares about the script? We'll, we'll make it better later. So it kind of, it kind of gets to the point of that. Um, so yeah, I, I like, I like that. Obviously, I like not having to fill out, you know, the whole uh, applications with grants and, you know, mm -hmm. writing the the essay, which, again, you put all this detail into when really it just comes down to what's the elevator pitch? <laughs> like, yep. They make you yep. do all these things and they are just like, well, if we don't like the pitch, then let's screw all that. Yep. So yep. Uh, grants have their place. Screenwriting contests have their place. And I think they're excellent avenues for funding um but we like to be we like to offer an alternative be a little bit more direct like you said not beat around the bush we just tell me what the hell your film's about <laughs> and tell it to me in a sentence and we'll judge uh how compelling it is yeah and the, the thing about contests and festivals about in all that you know you can you can you know go broke applying to everything that comes up but yeah. over time you kind of start narrowing it down to okay what what should i submit to what's worth my time and my money and you just kind of find your own way of uh doing things and uh i'm glad the film fund was able to fit into all that we're happy to be a part of your project happy to help yes. um talk to me about filmmaking and some of the films you've made what were some challenges you ran into in either production or post-production pre-production anything um, well, there's always, there's always problems. Um, <laughs> I could think of a multitude of problems. Um, you know, it's just kind of, I'll, I always say when nothing goes right, goes left. Um, you kind of just, when it seems like you've tried everything and nothing's working, there's always something uh, you can think of outside the box to write the ship. Um, what was that Project Greenlight, that one show? I, <laughs> they, there was a, it was kind of sad because they picked this uh, 
one director who was set on shooting digital instead of film. And I was like, I don't think anyone will care. But anyway, <laughs> uh, so one of the you producers... mean shooting on? I think I saw that one. He he wanted to shoot on film, not digital, right? Yeah, and that was kind of you know they they had locked down locations and all this stuff, and he was stuck mm-hmm. on this one thing. So yeah. I, I think that show was kind of made more for entertainment as opposed mm-hmm. to anything else. But anyway, <laughs> veering away. So there was this one producer that was talking about the pivot, which is something that always happens when you're shooting. Um, you know, as a director, you kind of get set on your vision and, you know, uh, I have to stick to the vision, stick to the vision. And then at some point in production, there's something comes up that threatens to derail your vision and most of the time it can't even be avoided so you kind of just have to think outside the box like my last uh short i did before this one uh discretion you can find it on amazon um there was this one scene that had to take place at a deserted library and i won't go into details but it I'll just say, if you watch it, it's the critical scene of the movie. So it had to take place in in the parking lot of this deserted library. And I was like, oh, it'll be magic hour. The light will be fantastic. Which is funny, because in Life Tune, I accidentally shot a key scene in magic hour, not intending to. So that's just (laughs) how life works. Um, And so I was set on this library. You know, I would see libraries in my sleep. I'd be driving down the street and I'd be like, is that a library? And eventually it was clear that this library situation wasn't going to happen. And I found an alternate location. Um, I'll I'll, I'll still be vague. But I realized that this location really didn't have a critical effect on the story. You know, Mm -hmm. the theme, the character arcs, they were all still preserved. And, you know, once I got off this specific library uh things worked out and much better than i think they would have uh otherwise Mm -hmm. and i was actually with life tune i actually wrote multiple ending i i foresaw the pivot and i was like Mm -hmm. okay i don't know if this ending is going to happen how i want it to so i wrote an alternate ending just in case and uh, we weren't going to use it until like the week before there was some some issue you know you're always thinking what what catastrophe is awaiting me mm-hmm. and sure enough the catastrophe started to present itself and i was like oh i was ready for you so then i <laughs> so then i got so then i i i plugged in that alternate ending i had written just mm-hmm. in case and actually it's a way better ending uh, that's great so i, I think a lesson there is not only be flexible with your vision, but be prepared to be flexible with your vision. Cause it seems like you are, you had another ending in your back pocket ready to go. Yeah. That's, that's really awesome. And you know, it's not even about changing your vision. It's just about distilling it to what your vision truly is. Cause you know, mm. you get hung up on all these certain details or, Oh, I want this shot. Oh, I want, this to happen this way but then you have to ask yourself is that really critical to the vision exactly yeah so if you something. if you know your story your characters your theme then when it comes down to it circumstances will kind of reveal what is absolutely necessary to your vision and what is you know just stuff you want to do mm, I, I totally agree with that and i think in that distillation process, you have your vision and how you think you need to get to that vision, but then you also have an entire cast and crew who can help you get to that vision too. And by listening to them and maybe being a little bit flexible in your approach, they can help you see that vision a little bit more clearly, right? Yeah, and I'm always I'm always asking people on set, what do you think of that? Like, what do you think yeah. of this? Do you like yeah. this? And, and I think know, as a director, you, there needs to be a line like, you need to you can't always ask everybody everything you can't always you have to fight for your approach sometimes too but i think i think talented directors know how to strike that balance and be like okay i'll listen to the cinematographer here um 
or no, like, damn it, this is <laughs> this is how I want to do it, and I'm doing that. I'm sticking to my guns. Well, and you know, just you know, you ask people their opinions and take uh, their advice. That doesn't mean you listen to every. Well, I mean, you listen, mm-hmm. but that doesn't mean like you do you everything they it. say. Sometimes, right. sometimes you need to hear someone else's opinion to validate your own Mm -hmm. be like am i sure about this and then you hear some of the alternatives and you're like well actually i I was right about that (laughs) so well your idea sucks so i'm gonna go with mine (laughs) well it's not even about does it suck or does it not but like does it does it so you know deep down like if something works or if it doesn't so Mm -hmm. and it's not like they're wrong and you're right but you just kind of have to go with your gut as a director Mm -hmm. on these things and you just know like, Oh, that strikes me as right. That's Mm -hmm. what's needed or that's, or, Oh, that's a good idea. But you know, maybe that doesn't necessarily uh, work for this. So yeah, it's, you know, it's very collaborative and, you know, taking other people's advice and opinions doesn't mean, you know, doesn't diminish you in any way. Um, And in some cases, like, especially with uh, the cinematographer, you know, I don't, I'm very much an actor's director. Um, Okay. The actors are kind of my, they're my, they're my tools, like my camera equipment. And with the cinematographer, you know, I don't pretend to know what they do or, Mm -hmm. you know, that I, I respect you. That's why I picked you. Because I I trust your opinion. So, um, yeah, it's just about respecting people and what they do. And then they'll respect you and what you do. And you can always, you know, uh, trade ideas, you know, uh, brainstorm. And sort of like I said, you have your vision and circumstances come into play. You know, that's what movie making is all about. It's a collaborative process. And whatever is true to the vision will come through and whatever uh, wasn't necessary to achieve that vision will kind of just fizzle away naturally. And you're Mm -hmm. just left with uh, your film. And I'm very happy with uh, what we wound up with uh, on Life 2. I love that. I love that approach to filmmaking. I think it's really a good point you make. You can listen to people, but you don't have to listen to that you don't have to go with the way they want to do it and it helps you really get to that end vision that other film you were mentioning the one you can watch on amazon did you take that to festivals uh yes um that well i actually learned a lot about the festival circuit with that one um i premiered it at um at the british film institute actually uh BFI Flair. It's like the I think oh, it's the so cool. I think it's the biggest LGBT film festival in England. Actually, I didn't did really go to England. I did. And oh, that's so exciting! Yeah, so I, I don't know the British. They love my sense of humor, apparently. But <laughs> um, yeah, so I actually didn't realize what an important film festival it was at the time until I got there and. We were at the BFI, um, it was, it's off the Thames River, and, you know, they're going on about the history and uh, Betty Davis and all these legendary stars, you know, walked these halls and you look at their museum they have there and you're like, oh, this is like the official film body of the UK. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, that was the biggest festival and there were some other festivals it got into but i kind of learned a lot about film festival strategy so okay. this this Talk is this is very instructive of where i was at the at this time in my life uh so i go so it's playing at um discretion it's playing at this huge theater at the bfi and the theater is completely packed uh oh wow and I was just like, oh my, oh my God, like, how are they going to receive this? And they, it, it was just the best reaction you could ever hope for with the That's film. Cool. They, they laughed and, you know, were 
and gasped and applauded at all the moments you thought, oh, I don't know if anyone will catch this. Right. And every mm-hmm. single, all of those moments they caught. And mm-hmm. um, it was just, it was, it was an unbelievable reaction. However, I also learned about some of my mistakes with film festival strategy. I feel like I kind of started big and then worked my way down when maybe it should have been okay. the reverse, kind of snowballing and those mm-hmm. bigger festivals. So I have this huge rapturous response, but all I'm focused on are the things I did wrong. Right. <laughs> so, I, and I was, a, I was alone and, you know, people tell you, oh, everyone should travel alone at some point in your life. And I'm glad I did because I learned I hate it. Um, <laughs> even, <laughs> even though I'm kind of a solitary person in my everyday life, when I go, when I travel, it's just, it's just, I just like to have at least one other person there to like bounce off with ideas. Mm-hmm. If I'm alone sure. on a trip, I have way too much time to think. So and you're just a crazy guy talking to yourself then. With no yes. About your ideas, yes. Right? Well, no different from when I'm here at home. But <laughs> so I have this huge rapturous response, but all I'm focused on are, oh, I should have done this. I should have done that. And I was all like depressed on this trip. And, uh, you later on I was like oh that was actually an amazing experience but the whole time I'm just going why didn't I do this why didn't I do that and I was just kicking myself and then on the day we on the day I was to fly back I think that was the day of the there was like a, a bombing in Belgium I think and the airport uh traffic was really intense like way more intense than i had expected and so i missed this flight but i was in line with (laughs) i think it was this other film guy and a lingerie model (laughs) who i had never (laughs) met i had never met before but we all missed the same flight and we're all like you know trying to rebook and all that and we're like just kind of chatting and stuff and we Mm. realized that the next flight wouldn't be for a couple of days and oh, wow. the guy had, I guess, bonus Hilton points. And we were like, oh, I guess we should just hang out together. We might as well stick mm. this out. And I think we kind of picked up on that. We were, you know, kind of chill people. <laughs> mm. And otherwise, we, I'm sure we would have just gone our separate ways. But we kind of, uh, you know, we're, 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 we kind of gel so we can do this. And so we all got a hotel room together. Oh and wow! Then, um, this and he paid for it with his points. Well, I mean, uh, I think it was like a really low rate, so we were all okay. it was like all an easy thing to split. And then um, this girl was like, "I need to get weed. Like, where can we get weed?" And then I was like, "Oh, thank God!" <laughs> I was like, "Oh, thank God! I don't have to be that person." So then we go on an adventure on the outskirts of London. Um, I really shouldn't be telling this story. <laughs> but, yeah, whatever. We'll, mark, we'll mark this episode as but, or whatever. But so then, uh, so we uh, got what we were looking for. And then we kind of found this spot outside the airport, like hidden among the trees and in the dark, mm. looking out on this lonely road to the airport. And we were just kind of, you know, sneaking away and, that's so uh, being funny. bad kids and all of a sudden I started getting this idea I was like this kind of sounds like a movie <laughs> and then maybe we're like outside the airport doing something we're not supposed to and then we witness some like horrible plot unfolding so and all of a sudden so, I was just so inspired with all these ideas so basically mm. I, I, I'm sure I veered way off whatever we were talking about but it was just we were funny. talking about film festival strategy. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was just funny because, you know, you go to these festivals and it's all like, oh, you go to the cocktail hour and it's all fun. But, you know, I was kind of down on myself that trip and I'm all, everyone's all like, oh, what do you do? What are you working on? Oh, that I don't care. This is what I'm working on. And yeah. it's all just very hollow and shallow. And I was just feeling completely uninspired, uh, mm-hmm. not... Uh, 
I, I wasn't feeling what I had, whatever I had hoped to feel on that trip. And then I have this crazy experience with these people I had never met before. And uh, mm. just all of a sudden had all these story ideas. And the writer in me was just like, oh, I got to write this down for later. So, um, yeah, veered way off from film festival strategy. <laughs> but I, I, guess as a, I guess as a filmmaker... What I can boil this down to is just do what makes you happy, but kind of follow, just kind of follow the path, however it leads you. You know, don't expect the path to look a certain way or feel a certain way. You know, things happen sort of like with, when you're on a set, you know, things happen that you can't control, but all you can control is what's my vision? What are my goals? And uh, they'll steer you the right way sooner or later. Mm. And now with that project, uh, is that something you raised funding for? Are you self-funded? Well, how did you do that? For discretion, um, there was a there was a Kickstarter um, for at least a portion of the budget, um, and then the rest was self-funded. Mm. So, what were some uh, of the challenges with um, raising funding for that? Uh, just the whole thing. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) uh, I think you were talking about this in one of your other podcasts, you know, short films are just hard to get funding for in general. So, and that was my first project made not as a student. So it was all a very uh, rude shock to me. Um, Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, I, I guess just convincing people that you're not crazy and that you have a vision. Um, mm-hmm. And so that always goes back to your vision. Like, like if it's strong enough, then you'll kind of weather the storm, um, however it comes. So, yeah, crowdfunding, it, it was a good thing to say that I've done before. Um, mm-hmm. I don't know that I would ever do it again. But... <laughs> um, <laughs> It's one of those things that you can say like, oh, I did that. So mm-hmm. um, it is definitely uh, a good, ex- a good humbling experience for any filmmaker to do at some point. Um, mm-hmm. So, yeah, it just depends on the project. There's always different challenges to yeah. everything. And yeah, convincing people to give you money is never easy. And then trying to convince them to give you money when there's no return on that investment with a short film is even even tougher. Um, so yeah, so, that, that so that's why, so, so yeah, I pretty much wound up self-funding, um, all my shorts, but you know, there are definitely advantages to that. You know, if it's your yeah. money, like even if things, you know, fall apart, you're like, well, it's just me <laughs> yep. versus if it's someone else's when you're like, Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a good point too. About that. Um, We've talked about vision. We've talked about film festivals, um, but just to we've talked about distilling that vision. So now to distill all of the advice you've been talking about into one nugget, for lack of a better word, what's some advice you would give to filmmakers out there? Um, don't do it. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> Save yourself. Do some, Do anything else. <laughs> well. I would say just kind of follow the patterns in your life, sort of like how I was saying, you know, I got distracted in my teen years, self-discovery, and then thinking I wanted to, and then majoring in business in college and thinking, seeing all the jobs they're talking about, thinking, I don't really want to do any Mm -hmm. of this. Even if I may be good at it, I feel like I'll wake up, in my 40s and like jump out a window um Mm -hmm. but then you kind of i kind of look back on the patterns in my life whether it was playing with the other kids in my dad's handy cam or writing my um my ghost script at 12 and uh just things always kept coming back to movies so it was almost like I was running away from the movies, but they kept chasing me. So if it's really, I would say if it's really what you want to do, it's what you're going to do. Like it was almost like there was something 
in my head that would subconsciously sabotage any opportunity I had to do something else. And, mm. and you know, at the time you think, oh, I screwed this up, oh, I blew that opportunity. And then you realize, oh, it was all in service of film. It kept coming back mm. to that. So if it's what you want to do, you know, you'll do it. And if you're doing it, it's sort of like I would say, like, don't get distracted. You know, just stick to the vision and don't to stick to the vision, but don't get set on how things are going to turn out or how they're going to shape mm. up. You know, if you're true to yourself, then what the end product is going to be is something you may not have envisioned in the first place. But in the end, you know. That is my movie. That's my baby. So, mm -hmm. and again, nothing goes right. Go left. I love that. Uh, anything in store for the future? What are the What are the plans for the future? I know you're releasing Life Tune right now. It's in post. Well, um, this kind of this is kind of how my pattern shakes out. You know, I'll work on a set and I'll just go crazy and making sure everything is perfect even if it's not what i initially envisioned as we were just talking about making every mm -hmm. making sure everything is uh is uh, up to snuff i would say you know dealing with all the crises and all that and making it all happen and then when it's all over i'm like I just want to go back into my writer's cave and never come out. And so then I'll go into my writer's cave for an extended period. And then eventually I'll start to get stir crazy. And then I'll just be like, mm, I kind of want to be on a set again. I kind of want to mm -hmm. be with people. So it's, so the, you know, uh, the future plans are release life tune, retreat to the writer's cave and then go on set again. Well, I already have been in, the writer's cave I mean it kind of it's weird how it worked out I finished life tune and then lockdown happened as I was already oh. going into the writer's cave so it was kind of it. interesting how that worked out um so I'm working well I wrote I've written three feature scripts um and so it's kind of just fine-tuning those um let's see i wrote one script in let's say i have this one script it's a stoner dramedy i would say um okay and it's centered around a um kid who's well a college kid who um has just graduated and kind of face plants into adult life and then his uh, father is diagnosed with pancreatic cancer and he has to step up and save the family restaurant. And mm -hmm. um, I actually wrote that pre-COVID and thought, and you know, there was some, some, uh, it started to go some places. Uh, it made the first round of the uh, Nickel Fellowships and I think was semi-finalist in some other contest. But, um, awesome. but, um, I always felt like it needed something more and the the recession of 2008 was kind of in the background of the story like the father's mm -hmm. restaurant was never able to fully recover from that but it was it was a, it was getting a little too far in the background and then covid happened and I thought oh that's the missing piece so mm -hmm. uh, adding that back in there and then the ghost script I was talking about that I worked on, my my twelve year old script, that actually evolved into a into the last script I wrote. It's a horror film, obviously, um, but it kind of evolved from a standard haunted house script into sort of like an Airbnb gone awry, and mm -hmm. it's actually set in the Poconos in pennsylvania oh, okay. and not too far from where we're in uh we're in philly here yeah well the family in the script is from philly 
And there's okay. kind of this tension when the city people come in to this little town. Oh, so I love it. All the, all, all the mountain people, they're kind of like, who are these city folk? Hey, and, if you uh, need a consultant on how to get the Philly accent accurate, call me up. I'd be happy to help well, They always mess it up. Well, it's, <laughs> it, it's funny because I actually, the last time I was in Pennsylvania, I was, I was a little kid. I just have vague memories of my parents. Mm-hmm pointing out the fields of Gettysburg and talking about the history. Mm. And I'm like, does our pool, does our hotel have a pool? <laughs> <laughs> so I, I really had no memories of Pennsylvania. So I found this is like tech consulting on a budget. I just found mm. <laughs> on Craigslist some people in Pennsylvania to kind of fill me in on, you know, is this all accurate and whatnot? And mm-hmm. it... Well, it's amazing how well it worked out because one of the people I talked to was a retired detective. Um, oh, wow. And there's a, one of the main characters is a detective. <laughs> so no I thought, way. Oh, oh that's perfect. <laughs> oh, well, this is perfect. So, uh, yeah, yeah, that's... Um, so that's... Uh, I'm really excited about that script. Um, it's a good, good old horror movie. Um, I'll probably do the rest. I'm probably going to focus on the restaurant first, just because I think that's more of a micro budget. Um, but yeah, so the, and then there's another uh, s- screenplay I wrote in college that I kind of wrote off as the first pancake. I don't know if you've ever made pancakes, but the first one always gets screwed up. Um, <laughs> so I kind of wrote it off as the first pancake. And then recently there was a, this whole social media aspect to it. And back in college, when I wrote it, Facebook was kind of viewed as, you know, connecting everyone, like we're all Mm -hmm. one community. And then in years since social media, um, I guess the dark side of it has kind of revealed itself, (laughs) as you will find out in Lifetune. Um, And so now I'm kind of thinking, "Hmm, I think there's potential here. So yeah, I'm I'm definitely not self-funding the features. So I'm just uh, going to tour those around, fine-tune them a bit more, but I'm uh, very excited. They're a natural extension of what I've done with my shorts. And uh, yeah, so still in the cave, but I think I'll be emerging uh, very pretty cool. soon. I mean, it sounds promising. You said the one made it through the first round of the Nickel Fellowship, so that's pretty impressive. Um, so keep up that momentum, right? Yes. Um, yeah. And, and like I said, sometimes it's just validation is all you need. Like, oh, OK, I'm not crazy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> like this, this is I good. Have, uh, <laughs> yep, absolutely. Uh, val- validation or even just like a kick in the butt, too. It's like, oh, OK, I, I can do this. Um, I, I know from personal experience, that's always been very important. I had a former I was on the phone with this former professor of mine slash mentor the other day. Um, and I was like, oh, I don't know what to do. You know, he's like, why don't you just storyboard that script you you haven't stopped talking about for a while? I was like, oh, yeah, I could do that. And I sat down and I storyboarded it. And I was like, Wait, oh, yeah, I, I forgot I know how to do this. So um, validation is always so important. And following the pattern, like you said, you had already been working on it anyway. So it's kind exactly. of like, what am I? That what goes am back I, to what you said. Yeah, what am I doing without being prompted? Like, what am I doing mm. without thinking? And you kind of look back and find these patterns and you're like, okay, I should do this. Well, Tommy, I want to thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us today. And I want to remind everyone that our current contests are now open. So you can go to the website, check them out. I want to thank everyone for tuning into the podcast, listening to myself and Tommy Garcia talk about filmmaking and traveling to faraway lands <laughs> remind i want to remind everyone that the winter 2021 narrative and documentary contests are open for three more weeks three so go check out the filmfund.co to submit your entry and check out our social media channels where you can find some tips on filmmaking as well as prize details we have kids split gift cards adobe creative cloud subscriptions which is what tommy won we have uh, expressway cinema rentals we got them on board to sponsor a, another two-day weekend rental um package so i'm super excited about that that's the black magic ursa very nice camera lenses package and check our website regularly for the most up-to-date information on all this great stuff sign up for our email newsletter check out the blog filled with great filmmaking producing tips 
And we have a new ebook too. I'm plugging everything today. Check out the ebook on the resources page of that website, thefilmfund.co, for great tips on the pre production process. Okay, plugs over. Thanks everyone for listening. Tommy, did you have anything else you wanted to add before we wrap up? Uh, Facebook.com slash Lifetune Film for all the latest updates. Uh, you can find me on Twitter, Instagram, Tommy Garcia Film. Um, yeah, I think, I think that's it. More to come. Awesome. More to come. Thanks, Tommy. Thanks, everybody. Talk to you soon.